to love this our next guest, and he spent the last uh, 29, close to 30 years at a local church in Woodstock, Georgia, and grew it from a small church when I joined in 1990 to a rather large church that we have now from 250 to over 17,000. But it was his passion for wanting others to see the Jesus in his life mm. that really brought people um, in the doors to this church and continues to bring the people in the doors. So join us uh, and introduce um, uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt. Thank you so much for being here, my pastor. Thank you. It's thank good to you be here. Thank you for being such a uh, passionate pastor about God's Word. And I, that's what I've always felt that it's helped me through the years to be able to sit under your teaching and that you take us right to God's Word and teach us what He has to say about how we should live and how we should walk forward in our, in our journey with Him. People are always saying, we really appreciate you preaching the Word, and I'm thinking, was there anything else for us to preach? Amen. So uh, I'm yeah. grateful that God gave us the Word. And as one friend said, we don't have to create uh, the menu to serve up and since we don't, at least we should serve whatever we serve hot. So Ooh, uh, it ought well to be said. passionate. Very well said. And you have such an amazing testimony. A lot of our viewers don't know uh, where you came from and how you got into the ministry. So tell them a little bit about uh, your childhood. And you met your beautiful wife, Miss Janet, who's in the studio audience with you tonight. And uh, But you weren't really in a place where you are today back then. So tell them where you got started with yeah. this journey. Well, I always go back to when I was seven years old and my dad checked out, so left my mother with uh, six children, so I have five siblings. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of his absentee, we ended up moving into a government project. And she worked in a factory in the daytime and as a waitress at night. Mm. So with uh, no parents there, we stayed in and out of trouble and with the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the age of 16, I dropped out of high school, began to manage a pool room. And uh, people ask me what sports I play, and I always refer to eight ball. It's the only <laughs> game I ever played decently. And so managed the pool room, stayed in and out of trouble. But someone invited me to church when I was 20 years old, and it's so important for everyone to know that most people that will have a relationship with Jesus will be because somebody invited them into the faith family to oh, hear yes. the gospel, mm -hmm. to see the love of God in the context of his family. Mm -hmm. And through that, God drew me to himself. And I was not a believer very long until I was constantly telling my story because the conversion in my life, people begin to think, why aren't you at the pool room? Why aren't you gambling anymore? How about all your drinking? And uh, all that was gone. And so as a result, uh, I became a fast track witness for Jesus and got to see a lot of my friends come to the Lord and wow. I was never any happier than when I was serving the Lord and through that I sensed God calling me into vocational ministry so I was pastoring my first church three years after I had my first Bible placed in my hand. Isn't that amazing? So. God is amazing when he calls us to do something. Thank God he equips us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That he does. I wanted to ask, are you, you're Native American, is that right? Um, um, Lumbee Indian, Lumbee? which is okay. Eastern North Carolina, which is a derivative of the Cherokee. Yes. Dates back to the 1500s, the Spaniards married the... Uh, into the Cherokee tribe. We have no reservation life, which didn't help us with scholarships and colleges and seminary, yeah. although it's changed now. So yeah. yeah, known as Lumbee Indian. Right, and could you ever imagine as a young boy growing up the influence that the Lord would give you now? Because everywhere I go, I hear such wonderful things about you and your ministry. Yeah. I'm speaking to a group of men tomorrow morning and I'm gonna deal with the stewardship of influence. And really, you can't lead people you don't influence. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what God would do with my life. Mm -hmm. And so the sad commentary is most people will never know why they're here in the first place mm -hmm. unless they come to know the Lord Jesus, the one who made them in the mm -hmm. first place, and then remakes them. Yeah. for the express purpose to bring him to greater glory. Mm. Yeah. Pastor, you're from Wilmington, and that's where you and Janet met. It was in Wilmington, North Carolina, and you began to pastor a church locally there first. And then tell us a little bit about the call uh, to First Baptist uh, Woodstock, where you've served almost 30 years. Yeah, uh, I was in Wilmington. I'd graduated from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, so I took the church I was converted in, ended up serving there for six years and Longleaf Baptist Church. And God greatly, greatly blessed that ministry. It became a very dynamic church, great um, syndicated, local syndicated television ministry. It was making an impact in the city. And Woodstock came after us. 
and uh, we had no intentions of leaving. We were in our best days. Woodstock had dismissed their pastor, dismissed their minister music. They were in turmoil times. And someone said, what led you there? Nothing other than Jesus. It was a divine call, and I believe that's why I'm still there. When God sovereignly mm -hmm. places you somewhere and you are so aware of how you got there, mm -hmm. you're reluctant to leave unless you have the same type encounter. Yeah. And so um, we left there and came to a church one-third the size I was pastoring. But every church mm -hmm. I've ever gone to has been considerably smaller than the one we left, <laughs> so with no exception. So uh -huh. the church would grow, we'd go to a small, we'd grow and go to a small. Wow. And so now the Lord's uh, left us here yeah. for these 29 years. And But we had no idea. I didn't come here to build a great church. I came here to obey God. Amen. And so we, we've not majored on becoming large. So a lot of times we're criticized for something God made us. I didn't right. go there. I can't change a life any more than I can create a star, to quote Charles Spurgeon. Yeah, that's good. But uh, God's changed a lot of lives and drawn a lot of people into the church, and for that we're grateful. Yeah. Glory to God. That's awesome. You know, I want to ask you, what, what about the times that you wanted to give up? Or have there ever been times when you wanted to just give up the ministry and how important is it to sabbatical and to rest yeah. in, as a minister? Yeah, m most preachers quit on Monday, so about yeah. uh, you know, every <laughs> yeah. uh, year on Monday you find a day. And what you do you do on Monday? Quit. You go get a Starbucks and then uh, you're, you're okay? Yeah, or what? You, one of the things I used to do in the early days, I'd have staff meetings on uh, Monday. Oh. And so that's why none of my staff like me. Oh. <laughs> so we, uh, we changed that up. Now we've yeah. gone to Tuesday because I don't want to be around anybody on, on Monday in that sense. Uh, yeah. You hmm. deplete yourself. That's really, true. I give myself, um, most pastors do, but people are available on Sunday, so the day begins very early, three services, three Bible studies. I disciple men, have lunch hmm. with, with people I can engage, and then maybe afternoon meetings. And so the day is so long that uh, Mondays I just sort of try to recuperate. But I did Good. get in trouble uh, with my health about five years ago, mm -hmm. and it had a lot to do with really not having margins in my life and diving back in, and it did serious damage. And so we've readjusted. I'm busy, but I'm busy with margins. Mm -hmm. it's and good. Um, so it, it's, it's making a difference. But yeah, sabbaticals are a must. I've never yeah. called a church to encourage them to give their pastor a sabbatical that they did not do it. That's so right. a lot of times they just need to be informed. So we take every July off, and That's it's just good. a great time to re fresh and sort of get refocused yeah. and we make it up immediately when we come back. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, you do. Absolutely. Yeah. And those are great messages for pastors as well, yeah. in which I know you have a huge heart for pastors. So I know we want to talk about that you're an accomplished author and, and have some amazing books out there that I know the audience will want yes. to um, read. But tell us a little bit about the Timothy Barnabas ministry mm -hmm. and your passion to encourage pastors because it is a discouraging and can be a very difficult um, position that they're in. Just the very name, Timothy Barnabas. Mm -hmm. Timothy for instruction, Paul instructing Timothy. Barnabas, the encourager. I believe the average pastor doesn't need to know more. He needs to be encouraged in what he already knows. Mm -hmm. So a lot of pastors started coming to us for counsel in the early days as God began to really bless in our life and grow the church. And I was speaking all over the world. So in that context, we thought we can't uh, continue to accommodate all these guys coming here. So I set up a platform for three days where pastors and wives would come to us for a time of instruction encouragement. Mm -hmm. Since then, now we've moved to like five different places in the United States, then all across Canada, and then I train other pastors, and we now are in 27 foreign countries. But pastors and wives come in. We were just in Palm Springs, California, just finished up in Branson last week. Mm -hmm. And we do Gatlinburg. We have to do two here in Atlanta. And so God's greatly blessed it. But um, it, it's a fun time. It's encouraging. We remind the pastors that they're very valuable to the mm -hmm. kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Try to That's treat good. them like kings and queens. And, and you do. Uh, <laughs> I've, my husband and I have visited you guys um, as you've, you know, done these retreats for these pastors. And you do, like you said, several every year mm -hmm. that people can look into um, being a part of. If, you know, if there's a pastor out there that's listening tonight that needs encouragement, mm -hmm. that's in this struggling place, yeah. um, you know, he can 
He can just go to timothybarnabas.org and find out when the next place is mm -hmm. and join us. Yeah. And God's blessed. We uh, realize most pastors are in smaller churches. Um, only probably 80% of the church's own denomination True. average under 200 people on the Lord's Day. So yeah. we offer scholarships or partial scholarships to help guys get That's there. So great. Such a great need in America today and the spiritual condition we're in. And yeah, we're so grateful true. for spiritual dads like you mm -hmm. and, and generals, you know, that God has raised up to help lead this nation and lead the churches, lead the yes. pastors. So thank you for that, for Thanks. your ministry. Yeah. yeah. And let's talk a little bit about your books because uh, you've got some great books. Let's talk about this first one. I know we're showing them uh, on the screen, but uh, the devotional Bedtime devotions with Jesus. Yes. Well, last year I've been writing for the last seven years with Thomas Nelson, the largest Bible publisher in the world, and doing devotional books for That's adults. Right. So last year they asked me to do one for children, and so I'm the general editor. Uh -huh. My wife wrote, my two daughters wrote, and then I enlisted other people, of which this year I enlisted Ann White mm -hmm. to be one of our contributors <laughs> as well. So oh, she wrote a week. And uh, this is number book. 20 on the bestsellers list of all the books, of about a thousand books that are out there. Really? So it's done really, really it well. So, um, it's a great Christmas mm -hmm. gift. It's a great yeah. gift, but it's really well well done. You only do about 50 words uh, devotional. You use uh, a children's uh, mm -hmm. translation for the text. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you give a one statement takeaway and a prayer yeah. for the child to pray based on the statements we write for that yeah. day. So it is, a, it is a great book. And then you yeah. also have your devotional that you write every year. And my husband and I purchased these for our employees um, at his mm -hmm. the work where he, the so business nice. he owns. And, I can tell you that the one gift, many of them have told me year after year after year, the one gift they look forward to is their next year's devotional. So I've good. had a lot of fun since we've gone to the uh, children's devotional because when I travel and a lot of people come to the table, I uh, tell the ladies we have an adult version for them and a children's version for their husbands. That's so good. <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. Very good. And last but certainly not least, you've, this is a great book. I use this and I'm and encouraging leaders that I work with and it's building your leadership resume. and. Just tell us a little bit about this because it is a very encouraging, challenging book for leaders, whether they're in ministry or whether they're in the corporate world. Well, we, I was asked by uh, Broadman Holman to take the sort of one-line statements of my life that I feel like has been used to get me to where God has brought me to and then write about five or six pages on each. So took things like basically as a pastor, I believe, people are under challenged. I mean, even with where we are today at Woodstock, we recently surveyed our congregation and 27% of our adult leaders said they still felt they were under challenged. Under challenged. Wow. So sometimes a pastor may think, boy, if I ask for anything else, um, uh, I'll yeah. be wearing out my welcome. But the truth is, um, He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think exactly. according to his power that exactly. works within us. So uh, that exactly. I deal with how to be an in, uh, a secure leader, uh, deal with the qualities of an insecure leader mm -hmm. and what it's going to take to bring them to a place of security. Mm -hmm. A lot of leaders are insecure and it's got a lot to do with the way they've been treated. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us have insecurities and mm -hmm. inferiority places in we our definitely life, do. So. Many, many of us do. Mm -hmm. And so if people want to get uh, any of these books, they can come to your website, Johnny johnnyhunt.com. Johnnyhunt.com. So and they also can there. find out more about your testimony from the pool room to the pulpit. And Pastor, th thank you so much, uh, number yes. one, for being our pastor. And thank you for being here with us tonight and sharing so much A with us. A real privilege. Thank yeah. you.